I think we could first discuss about uh, alternatives for the austerity policies and then continue uh, speaking of alternatives for uh, the lack of transparency and democracy in this project. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I want to ask you, um, there are uh, alternatives for for this current sit situation and the proposed uh, measures uh, the this um, European stability mechanism and and this austerity policy but why why don't anyone talk about this uh, for instance these uh, alternatives euro memorandum group as proposed. Uh, ECB as a lender of last resort, uh, that one we already discussed a bit. But uh, what about debt audit, wealth taxes, etc.? You can you can check them from from the PowerPoint slide. Uh, I knew there was a reason why I put it <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, who wants to start? Should I? Yeah, well, I can try to be. I, I'll try to be very specific. <coughs> what what we should be discussing maybe is how to how to find the money, basically. I, I don't think we should only be discussing uh, uh, how to get more money for loans, but uh, in general, how could. Um, we get the money for public investment to get out of the crisis. I think it's important to stress that what we need is public investment, because what we've seen from the European Central Bank lately is that they have been uh, very flexible on their uh, loan policy. Loads of banks have picked up uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it doesn't really seem to be reflected in the real, real economy. Why is that? because the economy is in trouble and you don't solve that problem by giving very, very cheap loans to banks. So, where to get the money from? Luckily, uh, I know a guy in Austria who's written a book just like Heike. Uh, some of it is in English, luckily, and he has a very, very specific proposal on how to find one trillion euros. First part on the agenda is the financial transactions tax. With such a tax at the European level, you could get 272 billion. If you, on top of that, uh, put a wealth tax, a capital gains tax, and a corporate tax, all of them uh, at a relatively moderate level, you can get 1 trillion euro. So, the money is there, you could say. It's possible to find it. Uh, what we need is the, is the, is the political will, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I could just follow that. And I mean, obviously, I put this up for a reason. And I, uh, there are some alternatives around. Another one is the Euro Memorandum Group that has written their alternative analysis and prescriptions on uh, uh, on the European economy for several years, and I thought the 2012 uh, document was actually very, very impressive. And this is the it in bullet point. It's obviously a very, very complicated thing, uh, but I would very much sort of recommend if you're interested in this to, to have a look at it. I mean, the way I look at this is, is uh, as a provisional utopia, which is a term by the uh, Swedish Social Democratic Finance Minister of the 1930s and one of the key ideologues of the Swedish labor movement. And his idea was, you know, I have to say that because I always say very pessimistic in terms of prediction, but we can also sort of become paralyzed by that. And, uh, and we need to think about alternatives because alternatives are, in a, when, when we can think about things being different, it is a precondition for mobilizing for something else, which is absolutely necessary to open up space for different developments. It can become a self-fulfilling prophecy to say that we are, we're all doomed and we don't have things. And from that point of view, even though I don't think the Euro Memorandum Group, the political constellation, is, is very, uh, uh, very propitious uh, for realizing that the very fact that there are alternatives are in and of themselves extremely important. So I would sort of put that into the context. I mean, a part of what they do, they also suggest the financial transaction 
factors. I, th I think probably where there has been some development on the European level, that's, that's where there are actually been some pros uh, progress. There has been, it's more dis disappointing in terms of regulation of derivatives markets, uh, over-the-counter uh, trading, bank reform, and so on and so forth, unfortunately. Uh, uh, debt audit and selective default, I don't, I mean, this is uh, uh, measurements that have been taken in, in Latin America to deal with the debt crisis. That I don't know a lot about them. But basically the idea is that uh, there is a political process to look at what, what would be legitimate debt to pay back and what wouldn't be. Uh, and that is obviously a way of trying to sort of reduce the debt mounting if you can do it in the context of some kind of regulation of of financial, uh, financial markets. I mean, I, I did point, but I do think that this has to go together with a set of other policies. There has to be, any one of these won't be sufficient. I mean, it's all how they sit together in a package. And I do think that we need some kind of expansionary fiscal uh, policy with this as well. Uh, and so probably a fiscal budget going up to 5% coordinated fiscal policy, and of course, this is where the fiscal pact is so debilitating because it doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, uh, where the surplus countries have to pursue more expansionary policies, and that also includes wage policies. Uh, for a few years, I think we need to run uh, 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 wage bargains well above productivity growth. Uh, I Anyway, I'm just going to keep on going and that this becomes kind of boring. I and mean, you can read the different bullet points and see yourself and look at the Euro Memorandum Group. But what I'm just saying, I endorse the Euro Memorandum Group as, a, as an alternative. Okay, that was clear enough. Uh, the, uh, I think we need uh, the discussions about concrete proposals. And one of the things that I think circulated here is the, uh, my analysis of the uh, European Union Commission's uh, proposal for financial transaction tax. However, I think that in this context it's, it's uh, more important to actually uh, see the um, proposals in a wider framework in terms of what they actually mean. And the Euro Memorandum uh, proposed, but this series of proposals, it actually comes down to proposing something like a social democratic uh, federation in Europe. And this is one of the uh, uh, three possible scenarios I discuss in my book, uh, The Anatomy of the Euro Crisis. Uh, there's also a synopsis of the book in, in English available as well. But the, um, there are three different scenarios. The first one is the neoliberal one, the one that is uh, prevalent at the moment. Uh, it's, it's the most likely one in the short run. Uh, it's going to imply, however, that the, uh, the deflationary spiral of the European Union is going to continue further. Uh, it also means a um, deepening of the democratic deficit, deficit in, in the European Union, which means that there is a very likely crisis of legitimation within the EU in the next 10 years. Uh, so I don't think that the prognosis of that particular uh, scenario is, is very good, but it's there. The second is the social democratic uh, federal state model, and all these proposals are basically about introducing uh, European taxes, uh, European fiscal policy, and other mechanisms of Keynesian type of economic policy, including income distribution and so on and so forth, and especially focusing on the uh, on the level of uh, aggregate effective demand in the European political economy as a whole. I think that's a very important uh, step forward in some ways. However, the problem is that the European Union at the end of the day is a very small part of the world. And the, the thing is also that the, it's very unlikely that this this particular version of the uh, federal state in Europe is going to uh, be realized as in, in accordance with these ideas only. I mean, there are other ideas about the European Union and, and its place in the world, in, in world politics in particular. And many of the uh, more right-wing thinkers or mainstream social democrats are arguing in favor of a stronger uh, European Union uh, on the basis that the, uh, we need a counterpoint to the or counter uh, wailing power to the United States, so we, the all alternative that the European Union would need to assume its, its role in, in both politics is economically as powerful as the United States, but um, in terms of military and security policy, policy it's not. So we need to build a European army, assume a superpower status, and so on and so, so, so forth. So there is another side to the idea of building a federal state in Europe. Moreover, the, the economy of the European Union is only a small part of the world economy as a whole. 
And the same dilemmas and the same contradiction are, contradictions are played out in the world economy as well. As well. The, the problem of surplus and deficits, for instance, I mean, they are <coughs> add up uh, at zero in the world economy as a whole. So any, if the European Union as a whole ties the uh, German way, export that growth in, inside the European Union in, in terms of having a, a long-term surplus in its, its trade relations and so on and so forth, it will actually reproduce the same, dile same dilemma as we are seeing now within the European Union. So it doesn't actually help in the longer run uh, from a global perspective. So we need also uh, a series of cosmopolitan reforms. So I'm, I'm actually advocating not European social demo democracy and European federal state. I think some of those reforms are important, some of them are actually necessary, and we have to move into that direction. But I, my approval is conditional on the fact that the European Union is actually advocating similar reforms in global governance. And I think that the, the only uh, ethically and morally and, and economically also uh, sound European Union is, is more like the cosmopolitan Europe of European carbon not the kind of a self-contained social democratic federal state model that many people advocate in Europe. It's, it's loaded with assumptions of Europe's efficiency. It's whole, the whole idea, including also the, the problem of the colonial past of, the, of, the, of Europe. I think it's, it's pretty important to bear in mind. In Finland, it might seem something that is not so relevant, or we, we think that we easily overlook the past. But in fact, I mean, in many of the visions about the, the importance and place of the and role of the European Union in the world, I mean, that past is still being reproduced, and we shouldn't forget that part either. So, uh, I'm in all in favor of cosmopolitan Europe <coughs> and global democracy and <coughs> global governance, including what I discussed here, original proposals of Keynes, for instance, from the 1980s, sorry, 1940s, uh, <coughs> the uh, International Clearing Union idea that Paul Davidson and others have been uh, more recently developing, and, and similar kinds of ideas. I mean, we need also global taxes. We need also global redistributional mechanisms. And ultimately, if we want to actually do something about economic growth, not, to, not only about the, the speed of economic growth, or its oscillations, or anything of that sort, but actually also shape the composition of, of economic growth in the world as a whole in the longer run. Because that's the only way of making economic growth sustainable also from an ecologi ecological point of view. That has to be done globally. We have to be able to control the destiny of humankind as a whole. And that means some sort of global economic democratic governance of, of the world economy as a whole. Uh, thank you. I, I think I'll make just two points. Uh, after my critique of, of uh, uh, the European Union and its, its governance, and uh, I think I, I would like to say that uh, there are some things which uh, are good and which emanated from the European Union. First of all, uh, the European Central Bank has been vilified for its uh, austere, uh, rigid uh, concerns for low inflation and so on. Uh, but as one said, I believe that between December and today, our system would have collapsed without the European Central Bank intervening in unforeseen ways. It's not the European Central Bank I would like to see, but it has done a lot, at least temporarily, to, to avert real meltdown. The other thing I would say is that for any, let's say, political movement or, or political party, uh, there's always the situation that are you in opposition or, or in government? Uh, there's a slight difference, as some people may have noticed. And uh, I'd say that because the crisis started in 2008, about uh, the, uh, the actually the right-wing center uh, governments in Europe actually injected huge amounts of cash to to. Uh, to save the banks and the system. But this time around, when the second tsunami <coughs> or wave comes, they, most of them have empty coffers, and most of them uh, have prohibitively expensive borrowing for sovereign debt. So they are actually in, in a pretty bad fix. But 
I would say that, that uh, if we look closer at what, for instance, the European leaders have said these last months, and what, for instance, the finance ministers said yesterday, they are aware of the growth problems of uh, broadening tax bases and many other things. If you read what they actually said uh, with Jutta Urpilainen among those uh, giving out this statement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question. Uh, would you like to, uh, Kenneth and Magnus, would you like to comment this uh, question about federal Europe? Uh, not federal Europe. Uh, okay. Well, let me take some questions. Or do you want to do that? Or? I'm quite happy. Yeah, why don't I? Okay. Federal Europe or not federal Europe? Um, I think federal Europe, yes, but maybe with a with a qualification, because I don't think necessarily the entire uh, European, all the member states in the European Union would be able or willing to move ahead. Let's talk about a monetary union, for example. And, and uh, it's kind of, being a Swede is kind of interesting in, in this regard. I, I voted against uh, the euro. And uh, if we had the referendum again, I'd, I'd vote against again. And the idea that my government would sign up to the fiscal compact completely incenses me. Um, and uh, but of course one has a dilemma because the European Union is part of the problem, it would constrain policy space, but it's also part of the solution. Uh, I think the constellation is different in different countries. I think in, uh, uh, in France and Germany, the left, the Franco-German left, is very clear that, that uh, and also I think in large part of Southern Europe, is that a certain kind of federal solution is still, is still the best possible alternative. Um, to remain in the euro, but for others like Greece, I don't think that it is. So I, I could I could imagine a kind of a concentric sort of variable geometry as the, the EU parlance is. So you have a maybe a slightly smaller core of European Monetary Union that <coughs> follow the broader the policies of the Euro Memorandum Group. But then you could also have other national currencies and, and more regulation of financial markets which create the basis of doing that is that you have some remain with national currencies pegged to, uh, uh, to the euro, a bit like in the old Bretton Woods system. And they could also then contribute to the overall uh, uh, regional uh, Keynesian complex, if you, if you want. I think that, that that is possible. But I would qualify this sort of euro federalism that I don't think that it is for, for everyone. And apart from that, I, I just say, I, 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 I totally agree with, with Heike's uh, qualification on the, on the global level. I think it is just that there is more density of institutions for this deliberation that you could have on the European level, perhaps, but on the global level. But that is not to negate that. And, and to be fair, I think the Euro Memorandum Group has a lot of really good things to say in terms of uh, sustainable development, the really summit, the uh, critique of the WTO agenda, and so on and so forth, and alternatives. So, so I don't think it is a contradiction necessarily. But, uh, okay. I think I'll be quick about it. Uh, first point, I think a European federal state, uh, progressive, democratic, uh, social uh, federal state, I think I think that's a very sympathetic but also a very long-term vision. I, uh, I think uh, there is, I cannot relate the real existing European Union to such a party. Really. I think were we to go in that direction, we would have to contemplate some kind of big bang in the European Union, some kind of, of uh, severe collapse. And I think, I think, I mean, that's uh, that's highly likely could happen. And should that happen, I would definitely be among those who would fight for uh, a close European cooperation on a democratic basis. Absolutely. I do think that uh, when I'm often in this kind of debate, and. I often stress one thing, yes, it should be democratic, but we really need to go into the details sooner or later, but because how do you do that? How do you build a European democracy? 
Do you think, for instance, that the present European Parliament is a jewel of democracy? <laughs> I think very few people would think so, except, of course, for the members of the European Parliament. But otherwise, I think very few, and, and it's not just because of the flaws of the institution itself, it's because it's super difficult for normal people to relate to the abstract politics of Brussels. It's not, I mean, debates in the European Parliament is one of, one of the best uh, kept secrets in, in, in European politics, I think. So it is a very difficult thing, and let's not pretend that it will be an easy thing. Um, uh, fourth thing, maybe I should say, yeah, if we had another vote on, um, on the Euro in Denmark, I'm quite sure I would vote no as well. Uh, I don't see I don't see the present discussions on the kind of a common economic policy and the federal economic policy going in the right di right, right direction at all. Thank you. And now questions and comments from the audience. Uh, Mikael, uh, I give you the microphone. I hear there is. It, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a critical um, comment on the program of the new memorandum for our question related to that. Um, uh, I think here it is lacking the word military and weapons and military industrial complex. This kind of thing is lacking there. Um, uh, even if we are discussing a huge economic realities, and one of example of this which has been far too little brought up in the discussion in the press in our public sphere, are those uh, weapons uh, acquisitions of the Greek government. Um, Daniel Bobadi in the European Parliament has tried to bring this up, but I re we rarely hear it mentioned, and I just spoke with somebody here who had even heard about it, that uh, Germany is selling uh, submarines for billions to Greece, <laughs> France, and the Euro European aerospace and uh, defense uh, uh, Consortium EADS is selling uh, fighter jets, <coughs> and then you have tanks being sold, and uh, Greek, Greece is a huge importer of military hardware. And of course, the, Germ the European banks have finances, financed these um, acquisitions, and now they are getting the money back through this um, mechanism which we are seeing. Um, which our government has approved in the last day and so forth. These are not only um, uh, political realities, these are also economic realities and a question of our model of society. We have a military industrial complex in Europe and we have nuclear weapons here in France and Britain. Um, so I would like to see a military conversion and denuclearization as a part of this program. And um, now I shall be even more evil and explain why it is not there. It is not there because the social democrats traditionally do not take up these questions. Even the Swedish social democrats are great exporters of arms. And so are the French socialists and so forth. Because they see this from a national perspective. And now I declare that I am in favor of a European army. But it must be a denuclearized army. Spinelli said this already in the 60s. And it must be not under the, go uh, on under the super power of the United <coughs> States. It's a question of liberation also from, from the nuclear monopoly of the United States. I know that Heike Patomaki has really thought deeply about these questions, but I would like to ask, don't you see the possibility of Europe taking the lead in nuclear, uh, nuclear disarmament and um, doing it unilaterally? We must have a movement like in the 80s for military conversion and a new 
not a new concept of human security. Thank you. Thank you. Another guest question. Yeah, I read that Euro Memorandum list, and I think that it is a very good list. And nothing is perhaps not right. It is the place of sustainable development. This is uh, the last <coughs> in the list. I think that it is the most important thing that, that we must continue after video meeting too. And I'm asking you, do you believe that it is possible to base this sustainable development on the idea of sustainable knowledge? I mean that uh, sustainable knowledge is very strong and based on hard facts which people can rely on and which are not led by political or ideological uh, ideas or pressure. I think that it is one of the key stones that uh, Europe can be based on if we can believe that we can develop sustainable knowledge. Do you believe on this idea of sustainable knowledge? Thank you, and now it's your turn. Very quickly about the um, security issue uh, of uh, nuclear weapons and so on and so forth. I think the first step uh, for the European Union would be to uh, put pressure on, on the UK and France to give up their position in the UN Security Council. That would actually deal with nuclear weapons and being a permanent member of the Security Council. I mean, it's a very modest step, but the first step is the uh, right direction. And uh, the European Union would assume that position. And the European Union itself is, of course, nuclear free. Not in, not in member states, but the, as a whole. I mean, the, Uni the European Union doesn't command any nuclear weapons. And then the question is, the problem is, lies in the nuclear weapons of the UK and France. And what do you do about those things? And then you could try to implement the ideas of the uh, non-proliferation treaty, which basically says that the, uh, all, all the nuclear, uh, nuclear powers are actually committed to the idea of total uh, denuclearization of the world. I mean, it's in the NPT treaty. And that's, that's something that is usually omitted. But the reason why India decided to go nuclear lies precisely in the fact that these countries uh, showed no willingness to actually implement that part of the NPT treaty. At least they used it as a justification for their position. And the problem is that, I mean, the uh, spread of nuclear weapons in the world. That's one of the reasons why I think, I mean, the fact that technological developments may mean that nuclear weapons is not actually the ultimate weapon. There are others like nanotechnologies and so on and so forth, and the uh, Cold War situation of, uh, uh, of MAD mutually assured destruction, that kind of a strategic situation can be actually become universalized and applies to the universe, mankind as a whole, humankind as a whole, and not only the uh, certain superpowers. So I think that's a, that's a real spectrum, and that's the reason why we need actually a systems of global governance that are legitimate, which means that they are able to control the world economy as a whole, and they should be democratic as well. And it's also part of the idea of a global security community that there are uh, institutionalized means to resolve conflicts by means of peaceful changes. In, uh, in practice, that means that you have to have de democratic decision-making procedures and ways of your formation and apply globally to have a global security community in India is also elements of global democracy as well. So these two things are closely interconnected and one of the reasons why I am supportive of this cosmopolitan ways of thinking about democracy and so forth well has to do with security issues. No, nothing please. Okay. Okay, I, two, the two questions were direct in my way, so I'll uh, I start to respond to you. No, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I mean, I think in all fairness, if you actually go and read what the Euro Memorandum has to say on sustainable development, uh, that part was probably written by Friedrich Otto Wolf, who is uh, a veteran of the, of the German Green Party and one of the funders. And I think he would be distraught to be characterized in, in, in thus social democratic terms. And there is actually a very, very strong statement in there about uh, uh, anti-nuclear uh, renewable energy, and also a critique of, 
or the contradictory ways, for example, in which the carbon emission trading scheme works in, in Europe, which is a good intention, but paradoxically increases carbon emissions in the, in the South, because it, it, uh, in, one example is it encourages the, the import of uh, uh, pellets from forests in the third world that increase carbon emission there, but not in, in Europe. And I think that is a good example of the kind of how we think, we think regionally and locally at the same time. I, I mean, I, there's no point in me going into the details. I think it's worthwhile having a look at what the Euro Memorandum has to say about, uh, about energy and about the, the green sides. And I think that when you read that, it is actually uh, probably has less to say on the military. Uh, except that they think that there is a problem with the militarization of ecological issues. But, but uh, you know, I think you made some very good points about military and so hey, so I won't say anything more about about that. Now, in terms of what kind of growth that we should have, I mean, I think it's very, very that's important. And in that regard, you're right. I think the Sustainable Development Park, in the end of the day, is the most important thing because uh, it, it's, a, it's a question about the content of an alternative. Uh, concept of economic growth and the quality of economic growth goes back to the question that you uh, that you raised and uh, instead of spending money on speculative housing uh, neurotic forms of consumption and so on and so forth and there would be the point about public investments as opposed to private investments is that we can perhaps steer things to to core processes around environmental sustainability I will also uh, stress uh, the political economy of reproduction, the uh, balanced gender relations in in Europe. How do we deal with uh, child rearing, uh, the political economy of care in a fair way in a society which is no, that no longer should and not isn't to the same extent as it was before patriarchal. I think that that requires a lot of public investments, as a matter of fact, for the sharing of child rearing, which I think in Scandinavia we gone relatively far and we take a lot of things for granted that isn't available in in the south or in continental Europe. I also think that that is a vocation for public investment. Reproduction and environmental sustainability will be the two things that I would I would identify. What do I think about uh, sustainable knowledge? Knowledge in the social sciences is a complicated thing. I would in principle say yes, but what does it mean? I think that there is a problem in transposing, and Hegel has written a lot about this on epistemology, philosophy, and science. Is there is a problem of transposing notions of objectivity from the natural sciences to the social sciences. Because it, it presuppose, in natural science you study objects and things. And when you try to impose that on the, on the social sciences, you have to treat humanity as objects. And I think that there is something very, very anti-humanist about that. So we have to think radically different about what rationality and knowledge means in the human sciences than we do in the natural sciences. And I think actually one of the problems that we have about the economic rationale of competition uh, uh, and lying behind things like the fiscal pact is that it tends to think about humanity as objects. Uh, this is a very, you asked me a very abstract <coughs> epistemological question, so I have to give you an epistemological answer. So I say, in principle, sustainable knowledge, yes, but let's problematize what that means because it is not an easy question. Okay, then we have a couple of questions here. Uh, let's take these, four, these three or one. Uh, <coughs> Money. Isn't it inside technology system and total bad person do more zero, more zero to creation more money this fiction world? Why? <coughs> so easy to create the paradise of criminal person to get pay more money when they do the bad things and punish when they want to live normal life. Same time they want to destroy all normal human beings life. Are you satisfied? Do you want this? Uh, my name is Christian Urla. I would just like to add one thing to Mika Berg's interesting and important viewpoints about the uh, increases uh, uh, arms purchases. Uh, the, the big and dangerous enemy which uh, raises arming itself against is Turkey and both are founding members of the NATO so it couldn't be more insane. <laughs> 
Yeah. About this big bang you mentioned. Is this big bang or does it mean or would it mean a ban on global capital? And relating to what Heike talked about, uh, how to prevent uh, the corporate interest from taking over the construction of this cosmopolitan euro and green global initiative? Thank you. Now, when I say Big Bang, what I mean is that I don't see that it's possible to build a progressive, democratic, federal Europe on the basis of the present European Union, particularly not based on the treaties of the European Union. I think the treaty is very much built to, uh, to serve specific purposes, uh, freedom of movement of capital, freedom of movement of uh, goods, and so forth. It has, uh, the, the treaties has um, led to the build-up of, uh, I believe, uh, undemocratic institutions, in particularly, particularly in the Commission. I, I can't see a progressive democratic European uh, state with a body like the European Commission in it. Particularly not with the role the Commission plays at the moment. At the moment, I mean, I don't think that's common knowledge, but, but who comes up with the proposals for legislation in the European Union? Only the Commission does. Only the Commission. Everything on legislation comes from the European Commission. Sometimes it's pushed by the uh, Council of Ministers, but it has a monopoly for that kind of thing. Is that democratic? Well, not in my book. Absolutely not in my book. So when I say Big Bang, what I mean is, uh, is uh, actually a very deep crisis of the existing European Union that will, in, that will enable us to build a new kind of structure. By banning global capitalism. By banning global capitalism. You don't know. As you're talking about the neoliberal hegemony in the treaties of the European Union, yeah. you mean that there is a a crucial problem of the yes, power there is. Of Absolutely. I mean, and it's in the treaty. I think, but over the, particularly over the past four, ten, ten years, uh, there are um, uh, mostly two laws that have been above any other kind of law in the European Union. And that is free movement of capital and it's free movement of goods. I mean, already there, you, I mean, those are the, the first two parts of the Constitution of the European Union. And it can, those two simple laws, which are a bit abstract, is able to uh, make a mockery of uh, labor laws, of public services, of public budgets, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a long discussion, but, but, uh, but, but that was my point. My point is, you don't just add a little something to the existing institutions and the ex existing uh, law of the European Union, and then you have a progressive thing. It's a pretty fundamental re revamp of European cooperation that would be necessary. Yeah, I, I think there were three questions, and the first concern is whether we are satisfied with the system of money making and so on and so forth. That's the one very brief uh, remark on that. The uh, universities used to be a place where you, which was uh, sort of outside the money making uh, business or market economy or commodification or social relations. I mean, it was based on other ideas. And I can tell you that, I mean, we must almost to fight those reforms by actually making the university as another place for uh, profit maximization or at least uh, self-regarding maximization of something else. And the, uh, the, whole, the whole idea that the free knowledge and autonomous reason or critical reason can be somehow combined with the logical form or economic is a contradiction in terms and it's also ethically of Anyway, the, uh, there was a point of the reason that Turkey, I would only add that the, uh, there's a kind of a further irony to the situation, because Turkey is also and has been applying for the EU membership for a long time, <laughs> and the, the, there have been all kinds of condi conditionalities on Turkey's behavior and so on and so forth, and even then, when Germany and France are selling arms to Greece because of the uh, so-called threat of, of Turkey. So it, it, there's a double irony there. 
voting comes from NATO. And <coughs> finally, the, the corporate interest, I mean, there's a uh, possible and, and quite illuminating historical analogy here. The, uh, the, the role of the European Commission in the European legislation is, is very similar to the role of Kaiser in uh, pre-war Germany, pre-first world war Germany. I mean, Kaiser was the only one that could actually initiate uh, legislation in the German parliament. There, there was universal franchise in Germany before 1914. But the social democrats did pretty well in, in 1913. They even gave their blessing to the First World War. But the, in terms of real power relations in, in Germany, in the imperial Germany of pre-1914, Kaiser was in an exact, exactly similar position than the uh, European Commission is in the European Union at the moment. And we have two questions, one over there. Uh, first question is, what do you define public investment? Um, the second one is, uh, do we all talk about, <coughs> in every round like this, uh, about the European uh, democracy? And by the way, we, or a side grievance, uh, the stability of the democracy in the, in the member states. All the member states where which are in trouble, but you could also take Germany, where just uh, the half of the, uh, the citizens go to vote. And when is a vote not longer um, saying what the uh, thing was uh, like to have? Uh, there has to be less than half of the, the citizens. Or, you know what I mean? Yes, no. I was wondering, <coughs> pushing through this reform package you have, this kind of housing reform package, fiscal expansion, redistribution, higher taxation, new wage policies, and having these political reforms that deepening better, more transparent democracy. Now, this package, how are you thinking of selling it to the finance and corporate sector? I didn't uh, do the alternative, so I'm not the right person, but, but, uh, but let me just say one thing. You don't sell it to them. Uh, you, you force them to accept it. Uh, this, this, would, this would be so contradictory to, to their interests. So it, in order to get there, you would require a pretty substantial uh, political mobilization. That's right. I mean, that's why I tried to qualify it as a provisional utopia. The political constellation isn't there. I'm enough of an old left to believe that these things depend on uh, the balance of power, social, economic forces, and they're not there. But the point was that having something like this at least starts to deal with the there is no alternative kind of discussion in and of itself. That is a small step towards trying to get beyond the impasse, I suppose, and I think that, well, you're right, it does require a, a, uh, a change in the, the constellation of political forces. I, I, on top of that, I would say that uh, you know, this would be, uh, there are parts of capital that realizes that there is a problem with effective demand, and uh, in a way I think that they're trying to sort of set terms for how that should be done, and at the moment it's Keynesianism all for the rich, in particular financial capital and monetarism for the poor, and I suppose this would be a way of, well, you know, with, a, with the European Central Bank uh, pumping in 500 billion euros that uh, allows, allows uh, the banks to increase their leverage again, and, uh, and all those kind of things, that's a, it's a kind of Keynesianism. Let's not forget that uh, the finance-led growth was also a Keynesianism for the, for the rich. Um, but that is the issue about the definition of Keynesianism. But I mean, I, I would say that, you know, broadly there would be an interest in how to sort of sustain demand. And I think that there is a division actually between, within the ruling class, you know, and the reason why Financial Times is adamant against what Germany is doing is that there is a division. So if they want to expansionary demand, this would be different terms under which to give it to them. Um, but no, not a very likely scenario, I'm afraid. Uh, but 
the public investments, yes. Uh, <laughs> define public investments. Uh, uh, public investments uh, uh, would be uh, uh, investments done by the public sphere, so the things that the public uh, uh, makes a collective, de uh, uh, collective binding decision to do on the basis of democratic deliberation and so on and so forth, funded through taxation, social insurance and so on and so forth. It's a bit hard off you, you kind of threw me a bit there. But, but, but look, we have a problem in Europe, and, and Heike talked about it in terms of democratic representation. We through uh, our competition policies and so on and so forth, we have created a regional economy, uh, but we do not have a corresponding public sphere to go with. We have some embryonic institutions, but there is no such thing as a European public. Uh, so you have, there are national publics, but those national publics are being disenfranchised uh, by the structure, but they are not being replaced by a European public, because there is no such thing as a European public sphere. There are embryonic tendencies towards it, but maybe maybe we could think about strategically about what we could try to do to create, to start to create the European public sphere. That's the, the sort of the whole idea of European integration theory that that should happen. It hasn't hasn't happened. Is, do we think that it would be a good idea to have a European public sphere, uh, I, or are we happy to sort of revert back into international uh, <coughs> solutions? Uh, uh, I mean, Heike talked about the possibility of using the referendum mechanism, for example. Is there a way of instigating a European uh, referendum, which he tells me the constitutional treaty allows for? Uh, if you get, what is it, signature of two million people in, in Europe, you can have a referendum. Would it be a way of getting a referendum to... Uh, uh, and then uh, campaign to vote no against uh, the fiscal compact. So that's that's a cue for Heike. And your idea about the European public? The, um, the point of this kind of a referendum would be not only in the referendum itself, but in the uh, in the politicization of things it would create, and the uh, the public sphere that uh, would result from that kind of a politicization. And that might mean also the uh, reorganization of political agency. One of the things is that the, the existing political parties that we have, they all originate in the uh, era about 100 years ago, and the uh, international states. I think that we need, need to rethink the uh, uh, forms of political agency we have and can have in terms of rethinking them in terms of time and space. And that includes kind of a longer term visions perhaps, but also the, what, what are the spaces where you can act politically? And it's not only about competition, international elections, or anything of that sort. I mean, that's quite outmoded. In, in many ways, we feel that the uh, governments that we are seeing are just, uh, they're like a uh, group of actors uh, playing a drama that nobody believes in. <laughs> and that the, uh, the real show is somewhere else. But we don't quite know where that would be. And the, 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 the challenge is to rethink political agency in terms that would be able to tackle the real power relations in the global political economy as we, as we see them. And I think that the, that might um, yield ideas such as uh, global political parties, that the, um, they might be political parties still, but they would redefine their task in a different way, in a much more dialectical way. It would be also about criticizing and transforming existing institutions. It's not, there is no global parliament as yet. And the, uh, they, they wouldn't be competing for uh, in parliamentary elections. They would be doing something else, institutional transformation, and creating another kind of a world. And the, one of the things that they could do in Europe for it would be to um, reclaim uh, the public space in all kinds of ways. And that would mean, among other things, I mean, public support for uh, media. I think media has to be re-publicized uh, or politicized. But, uh, the uh, spaces are not necessarily any more national, I and mean, they have to be uh, something else. And that, of course, leads to a number of different problems. One of them is, of course, the, uh, the one the, uh, uh, of, of language. I mean, what is the language that we are supposed to use? English only or something else in Europe and, and worldwide as well? Uh, should we only take English as the lingua franca, or do we have to rethink the whole issue and question of, of language in a different way? And what, what is the cosmopolitan policy of language? I mean, the, my own tentative answer would be to educate every single citizen of the world at least in three or four languages. And that would be part of the uh, educational program of um, progressive cosmopolitanism. Uh, I'll go back to, to some of the democracy questions. First of all, I find some common ground with Kenneth about 
the position of uh, the uh, Commission because uh, we, in a democratic union, imagine uh, we would have accountable government. On the other hand, every government needs a civil service, so you wouldn't get rid of all the types there. Uh, then the other one is that, that I also agree, in part at least, with uh, the notion that, that the a basic law for political entity at European level, it has two, two uh, objectives uh, it should fulfill. One is that it should prescribe uh, not the contents of the policies, but the ground rules for democratic governance. And the other, other thing is that it needs uh, to, uh, to guarantee <coughs> fundamental, fundamental rights. These are the two things the basic law should do. Then, uh, about national democracy, uh, I'd say this much, that uh, 27 national democracies are not enough to make Europe function. But national democracies, of course, are needed anyway, uh, uh, because there need to be uh, entities, political entities, closer to the citizens with more, uh, let's say, tasks uh, which have to do with, with everyday life. And then about the the European Citizens Initiative, where you need one million signatures, I think it has been, been made very difficult. It will be possible mostly for well-paid lobbyists to, to clear the hurdles, not for ordinary grassroots movements. It's too complicated. And uh, the one thing few people think about, that, as I said, if you try to do something in the European Union, uh, you bump into the walls of the treaties. And now uh, you come even closer, because the European Citizens Initiative, which is this decision thing, uh, is only possible if it's about the question where the Commission can propose the rules. So the whole intergovernmental sector, which means, for instance, economic policies, uh, are outside of the possibilities. So here, here come, it's really, uh, I say, uh, the whole system is more a bluff than, than anything real.